Well, thanks for joining me, Mark. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. No, I, we were just saying it. I, I'm keen to get more artists on because I think they've got a kind of unique perspective of the natural world and maybe not so clinical as some of the scientists and other people that I have on here. So it'd be great to get some of your views and particularly hear a little bit about your uh, your street art. But the, the first thing I want to ask you is, is what does ATM stand for? Because I had a look online and thought, what does that mean? And I was trying to work it out. So is, is it a secret or can, can we find out? Well, it does mean a lot of different things depending on where you're coming from. So, yeah, I mean, that, that was part of the humour of it as well. But originally, um, I and, a, well, the three of us, were. it was about 20 years ago, we were really kind of outraged the fact that street art was becoming very commercialised. It was becoming a product. And, um, yeah, Banksy opened that shop in <laughs> Oxford Street, you know, um, what was it called? Uh, Santa's Santa's Ghetto or Santa's Grotto. Or yeah, whatever. that was it. Yeah. You know, where it, it started selling, you know, because the whole point of street art in a way was that it couldn't be uh, commercialised. It couldn't be taken away and put in a gallery or carried off by somebody. It just existed in in the environment. So it didn't have a price on it. You know, that's that's one of the uh, appeals of it. And um, And as soon as it becomes a commercial product, and then it starts getting used by advertising and, and, and the potential for that kind of radical stuff to seem trendy. And it, and that, but then it's, as so often happens, then those things are kind of subverted by the big commercial interests and they just become a kind of a cool thing. So people put some street art on, on their wall and they might well be, um, you know, a kind of affluent banker, but it makes them feel cool. And um, so it, take, it takes some of the energy away from it. And so some of the kind of, the, it's the grass, the thing I like about street art, it's the kind of grassroots aspect of it, that it uh, uh, it cuts across class boundaries, the, you know, status boundaries, it's available to everyone. You know, lots of people who don't go into art galleries, so you don't have to go anywhere, it's there. And, um, and that's what I like about it. So yeah, to get back to your question, we were, ATM was, and it was a it was a play on the ATM machine, the cash machine, dispensing um, cash, right. turning turning this kind of movement into um, commercial interest, and and we called ourselves anarchist troublemakers. So we kind of was we were doing graffiti and stuff, so trying to subvert that and trying to point out that you know radical social movements or political movements or whatever, as soon as they start kind of becoming commercial they they can often get sidetracked and lose lose the the original motives for doing it so that, yeah that was, that was where it came from right okay i, I remember watching a um a documentary about banks and he was saying originally that he, he was selling his art it might have been in santa's grotto or whatever it's called but it was relatively cheap like 20 20 quid a pop or whatever but then people was then reselling it for silly amounts and that's one of the things that prompted him to raise his prices just so that other people, I mean, that's why he's, I'm assuming that's why he said it, but like, because other people were profiting off it anyway, he thought, well, I might as well uh, get it or something along those lines anyway. Yeah, but yeah, but I mean, I mean, there, there's other sides to it as well, because obviously street art, it's hard to make money out of it in itself. So artists make money from prints, limited yeah. edition. You know, it, you know, there are, there are, you know, which enables the street art to continue. So yeah, there, there are ways, but it was just, um, it just seemed, um, well, it, it was a bit like the punk movement, you know, it, when it first started, it has an energy, you know, it's people doing things for, for their own sake, for the inherent value of why they're doing them, you know, uh, it, that was like the antithesis to the big stadium rock bands, you know, it was like yeah. people learning to play, actually, half the time while they were on stage, and um you know, you could see them develop, but it was just ordinary people. And I, I, I like that, the fact that uh, anybody could do it. You weren't dependent on huge infrastructure. And it's a bit like the same, same thing with the street art. You know, people, anybody could just go and do it. And, uh, and, uh, and that, was, that was the kind of the energy of it, which I, which I'd, I, still, I still like that. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. And of course, you're combining that with a love of, of natural history and nature and, and wildlife and whatnot. So I wondered... What's been your kind of lockdown uh, escape while this has all been going on? Do you, do you bird watch? Do you go out and, and, and enjoy nature in that way? Or is it more kind of with a, with a kind of paint or, or a paintbrush getting out there you prefer to do it? Oh, I've been walking a lot during the lockdown. So I've been, yeah, I, and um, yeah, basically seeing um, 
seen the nice places, what um, whatever I can find, really. Um, on foot, I mean, I walk anyway. I like walking a lot anyway. So it's not that it's not been that different for me. It's just that what I've really missed is going um, traveling around the country and doing different things, you know. So so it's been more lo more, more local stuff. Are you, are you near any of the parks? Are you near any of the London parks? Yeah, I can I can walk to Richmond Park, which is fantastic. And oh, brilliant! In the, yeah. Uh, in the first lockdown, there was no cars, no cyclists, and no planes overhead because it's the Heathrow flight path. And there's you know normally there's planes going over every every two minutes, and um, it was silent and beautiful. You could hear hear the birds singing, you could hear the skylark singing, and it was it was really special. Yeah, that was really. I mean the. Unfortunately, they, they've allowed cars back in now, you know, which is, I mean, there's, there's been a campaign to ban cars from Richmond Park for, for years, and it's so, you realise how beautiful it, I mean, it's a beautiful place, but even more so with, without cars. Yeah, I've only, I only went once years ago for the, because it's one of the the kind of premier places for the stag route, isn't it? You get like photographers from all over the, the bloody place going to go photograph them, but um okay. I did go and it was amazing. The, the light was phenomenal, like early morning. I think because it's kind of higher up, you get a good sunrise normally and the light was just golden and absolutely beautiful. The sound of parakeets going overhead. It is, uh, it's a unique place. It's, it's, ma it's magical with the, yeah, the old ancient oak trees as well. You know, it really takes you back in time. I love it. Yeah. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Uh, and so where did street art start for you then? Because obviously um, it's not something you've just taken up, is it? I'm assuming. No, no. I mean, like I said, we were, I was doing the, I was doing graffiti and stencils and things, and I've always painted. Um, so I painted on canvas and stuff like that. And um, and then I was doing some voluntary work here in Acton, where I live, with a local car, a local arts community group who were doing lots of things to try and um, improve the life of residents on the South Acton estate. It was like a big sprawling neglected estate, and uh, we just. Uh, Again, it was people I was collaborating with, work, been working with for years. We got the opportunity to do some uh, lo local art, you know, in, with the residents. And um, so there was there was some people who were doing some mosaic, and I, I I was doing paintings, and we and we got yeah, I got the opportunity to do these walls, and um, and then and then I, I mean, it was interesting really. I, I decided to paint a big bird. There was a snipe that I painted, and I painted it on Bollerbridge Road because. Um, there's actually a river flowing under that, under the tarmac now, it's all hidden, you know, like so many um, streams and rivers in towns and cities are, are on yeah. the ground. Yeah, London's got a lot of lost rivers, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it, obviously it was a place where Snipe used to live, so I thought it's a perfect um, perfect spot for that. And I was very surprised when I did the painting that how quickly I could do it on a large scale. It's paradoxical really, but I can I can paint faster than I can paint doing a small small piece on a canvas river. Really. So how long did did it take you to do that? I think I can picture in my head that what you're talking about. How how long did it take you to make that or paint it? I should say. That was two or three days. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So not. I guess if it's bigger, because something small is quite intricate. I guess. Whereas if it's bigger, it's a little bit easy. I, I'm I'm not an artist whatsoever, but I'm guessing it's easier if it's bigger. Yeah, with something small, there's less there's less margin for error. You know, you've got you know everything has to be precise and it's exact. You know, something a tiny bit out will look really wrong. Whereas um, it's much freer on a large scale. You you've got more. Yeah, you've got and it and it's more physical as well. So I'm actually you know re using my whole body to paint and moving around and <laughs> good exercise. <laughs> really good exercise as well. It's the whole process is great and and also there's lots of people. Um, you know, you're outside, so there's lots of people asking, saying, oh, why, what's that? Why are you painting that? Oh, so it's not like you've not got a curtain around you or anything. Like, while you're doing it, people can see what you're doing. Like, they'll come and say, oh, you know, what are you up to oh, sort yeah. of thing. Oh, that's good. That's quite nice and inclusive then, I guess, isn't it? Oh, yeah, well, because that was a ground level. You know, quite a lot of them are a ground level. So, yeah, people walking past all the time, you know, making comments or asking questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it can actually get too much that to, to the extent where I haven't got, you know, I'm not painting. So if I'm, if I'm up a ladder or up, up scaffolding, it's, it can sometimes be easier. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, cool. So, so what's your process then when you, um, because I, I guess that instant they asked you to do that. I mean, is it normally that someone will come to you and say, we, we'd like a, a bird here or, or is it sometimes a case of uh, putting a black mask on and, and delving into the night to go and paint a bird on the side of a building? 
I don't paint the birds at night because no, okay. <laughs> I paint. I use because uh, uh, they're all done by eye, and I won't be able to see. I won't be able to see the colours. No, and, okay. Uh, you know, and it takes several days. It's not something you can really just. Yeah, you can't. It's not something you can creep up in the dead of night and do without being noticed. So no, so, fair enough. And oh, um, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Mark. Yeah. Go on. No, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So they are the the big bird painters are. are I nearly always got permission unless the you know some of them being very isolated places where it's not not so necessary but yeah yeah fair enough and and how do you pick the species because of this so i know you you tend to lean towards more endangered species to try and give them a bit more of a a profile but what what's the process for picking species why why go for one another is it is it site specific like you mentioned with the snipe or what what goes in yeah, your head I, I, always, I always aim to make it site specific you know, I, I like that idea of a local connection because a lot with a lot of um, natural history, conservation and stuff, you know, the, the problem can often be perceived as being somewhere else, you know, whether it's elephants, you know, in different African countries or whatever, or tigers in India. It seems very far away. It's quite distant. And uh, people don't realise how what a nature depleted country this is. You know, it's one of the worst in the world in terms of disappearance of na native creatures so um I, I want to make that point really of what used to live here so i often paint yeah like like on that road where i did the snipe i did also did a gray partridge and a barn owl with um you know looking at old paintings of acton when acton wasn't part wasn't actually london it was you know like it was a village on the outskirts of london not that long ago and um yeah there was little orchards and um market gardens and hedgerows and and, and they were, all those birds would have lived there then it was it was an, and you know they could, i think they could they could still do so you know in a lot of places it's just um sort of modern farming and modern urban planning doesn't um doesn't consider any of that whatsoever so there's no space there's no space for those uh, birds to live uh, but it doesn't have to be like that i don't think no, but it always, I mean, we mentioned the London parks early, but it always surprises me. Like, I mean, so Richmond Park, I think it's got little owls, hasn't it? And yeah. and it did have hares. I don't know if it still does. Does it still have hares? I don't know about that. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think at one point, and it might not now, but I know until recently it did. So a lot of these parks, you know, in the in the middle of this urban safari have got animals that people just wouldn't even consider. And, and, and you know, to a lesser extent, you mentioned places on the outskirts of London as well. There'll be wildlife there that people maybe just aren't aware or, or were there until recently, but all too quickly we forget, unfortunately. Yeah, and like kestrels, for example, every time I go to Richmond Park, there's kestrels and there's something you don't really see that, that often simply because, um, and they were very common, you know, where, where I grew up and they were just, not. it was normal to see kestrels all over the place, but now it's quite unusual. They have, obviously they need certain habitat where they can hunt voles and, and uh, that's just gone in a lot of places so yeah it's it, it, i find it so strange that these these birds that were so common have suddenly become quite rare in a lot of cases it's amazing isn't it with some of those i mean the the one that stands out to me and i didn't know till um till recently talking to uh david lindo you know the urban urban birder yeah. and he mentioned about the uh is it the carrier pigeon there's a there's a pigeon in, in america that was so common i think it was the most oh, common but Passenger, Passenger, sorry, that's the one. That's the one, and it was oh, so yeah. common. It like black. It would blacken the sky, and there was all these anecdotal reports of that. And we wiped yeah. them out, and it's crazy, absolutely crazy. So never take there for granted flocks, the common things. There were flocks, yeah, hundreds of miles long, weren't they? That took yeah. days to. Go yeah. Ahead. Bonkers, and they, isn't it? And they, and they would stand beneath the flocks and shoot, and hundreds would fall down. They actually used passenger pigeons as a staple diet for the slaves. Is that right? Uh, oh, it's crazy, yeah. Common bird like that, and it's just... It was, mass, it was mass slaughter. Yeah, absolutely crazy, isn't it? And, and, but, and the other thing, they chop down the forests as well um, because uh, they, they're a communal species and they, and they nested in vast numbers in, in forests and um, that was part of their demise that all forests were chopped down. Right. I did, yeah, so I didn't, I'd never even heard of them before. It's funny, isn't it? And then you come across these, these lost... Uh, Lost species. What, what's the reaction been like for people then when they've seen? So you've you've done your your, your street art. Um, do you ever kind of see what people think of it? Do you kind of hide, not hide, but just stand there and and see the public reaction to it? 
Oh yeah, people, people, you know, ninety percent, ninety nine percent of people really love it. Yeah, yeah, people. I mean, when I did that one, it, you know, there was an act and people were shaking my hand, saying thank you, and you know, uh, they they value it. One one father actually said, uh, my my son isn't, you know, it's a Somali fellow said, my son isn't going to get into trouble if he's standing next to giant <laughs> painting of night. And it, it, I thought that was very, uh, very interesting though, because it says a lot about how environment um, creates behavior. And that if people live in brutal, you know, soulless environments, they do behave in a different way than if they, if they live in, you know, very congenial, nice, humane places. Yeah. So, that, that was a real insight, you know, and he felt he just felt that straight away. No, I, so. I agree. Definitely. I, I grew up on a council estate in, in Nottingham and in, in our shops, there was a lot of uh, trouble, I guess. So they the council uh, bought these big flower beds and they put these big long daffodils and uh, what else did they put in like primroses because it's not cool to stand there <laughs> to stand there flowers or what or they would perceive it not. So the trouble did go down. It's weird how simple things like that. Uh, can make a bit of a social difference. And it looked nice as well. It, it brightened the place up. I mean, it's just colour as well. I mean, what, yeah. when, I did the, when I did the snipe, I just realised that, that all those blocks, those council blocks on that estate, they were grey or they were actually painted some horrible brown colour. And I was thinking, why couldn't they have been painted lime green and orange and yeah. pink or what? You know, so I, I painted the background of the snipe a nice pale pink. And it's just, it, that in itself, you know, just... Um, just colour uh, can make a huge difference. Yeah, just pops out, doesn't it? Well, it's just nicer. To, it's yeah. just nicer on the senses. I mean, I often, when I used to travel around Europe a lot, you know, I mean, I'd come back uh, to this country and I think, well, why is everything so grey and dull? And, you know, and why are the windows in houses so small? You know, like after being in Holland or whatever, they've got big windows, and nice coloured buildings. And it's, I don't know, it's a strange cultural thing. It's it's a, a, a I'd never thought. To, Sorry, Mark. Yeah, I never thought of that before, actually, thinking about it when I've been to places like Hungary and France and, and just, yeah, any, anywhere but the UK. It's so colourful, isn't it? Yeah. They've got, yeah, they're just much, much more um, creative with architecture. We really seem to like the kind of the, the severe block with small windows in it in this country. And even a lot of modern architecture, you know, that you might have, you know, they, they go for the, the varied brick colours and all that, but the actual shapes of the windows and the designs are so kind of flat the kind of flat pack designs so i don't know yeah you know i don't know why they don't like verandas and uh, no it's a weird one it is a weird one if um if you had your choice of any building that you could paint on so let's just say you've got the permission you can do it is there a building that you'd love to to do a a bit of street art on yeah i, I mean there's not a, a specific no, okay. I mean, well, it's, it so much depends on the context and uh, the shape of the wall, you know, what it suggests and what might work on there. So I'm, I'm always seeing gable ends, you know, in really good in really good positions so that, you know, you might be walking up a hill and there's a gable end at the top of the hill and, and something on, on that would look fantastic, for example. So so I see, that, yeah, it's, it's there's not a, a specific wall, but... It, it no, okay. The aspect of it and... And the surround, you know, its surroundings. So like, it's nice to have a wall with really good sight lines, so you can see it from different angles, from, yeah, from close up, and yeah, and also what's around it too as well. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, so so they're more, they're they're the mo the main things really. I guess near a road potentially is good because people driving by can see it as well as well as a footpath. Oh yeah, I did a yeah. I painted a cuttlefish um, down in Portsmouth for. Um, um, Secrets of the Solands, and uh, there was a campaign for the Living Seas, and and that was on the main road going to the the, the Isle of Wight ferry. So you'd get uh, uh, traffic, and <laughs> they'd have to stop and look at the cuttlefish. So that was that was perfect. <laughs> Four star. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have any choice. Yeah, and that that segues nicely to to my last question, which is: although birds take up most of your work, you have done lots of other animals as well, haven't you? Yeah, I, I mean, I've I've painted quite a few insects recently, which uh, which I really want to do more of because they're often kind of they're not taken seriously, maybe their needs, but they're the foundation for, for everything else, really. You know, they they're the 
you know, there's, you know, yeah, the birds and the mammals and all that depend on healthy insect populations. And as insects are disappearing so quickly in so many places, it's really important to focus on them and their habitats and uh, the, you know, the way we treat them because all the overuse of pesticides in farming and in gardens is, is a real disaster. So, so if people, re I mean, I think often people don't realize when they're using uh, aphid sprays or weed killers in their, on their lawns or whatever, on, on their roses, they don't realize they're killing the food supply of the little birds that they lament the loss of. So those, thing, those connections have to be made and insects are fascinating and uh, incredible and beautiful as well in their own right. So. It's quite a nice juxtaposition, I guess, as well. If you've got like a an insect that's only a centimetre long and then you're painting it, you know, <laughs> 20 foot by 20 foot or whatever. It's because yeah. how, how many people are going to stand and look at a, I don't know, a, a ladybird for any amount of time. But then when they see it that big, they're like, wow, actually, maybe I should take more time to uh, have yeah. a look at that. Exactly. When you're and doing drawings of them and studying them, you know, I did this Norfolk hawker dragonfly down in Lower Stoughton. You realize how what incredible beings they are the way they're, they're put together their construction as well it's yeah. almost mechanical isn't it yeah it's just fantastic things yeah and yeah i paint I've, i also um painted some fish recently as well down at palmer's green i did a whole underwater um kind of river scene so that was not that was really interesting is that the that pike you did yeah, I did a pike, yeah. I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bit biased, but yeah, I really like that. I always think pike lend themselves very well to art just because of their shape and the vivid patterns along them. No, absolutely. It's like I've, I was, I've been dreaming of painting a pike for, for ages, because, simply because of, like what you said, the shape, the form of them and the, 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 the patterns and the colours. And, and, the, and there's lots of variation, so there's lots of potential to paint more pike in slightly different ways. Yeah. You should definitely do a grayling at some point. They are their their, their dorsal fin is phenomenal. They've got like mauves and yeah. kingfisher blues and reds. They're just like like a painter's palette in themselves. Beautiful fish. Wow. Yeah. No. No. Definitely. I'll definitely uh, yeah. to do one. I'll have to. I'll have to nudge some of the fish uh, charities to um, get you to do oh, something. Yeah. Oh yeah. Please that... do. No, I've, I've looked. At, I, I mean, the fish are just you know. Yeah. The colours and the and the the sheen and the shimmer and the shape of them there's huge potential there for, for big paintings definitely yeah yeah well that sounds good to me but look it's fascinating to hear it all because i say we don't really get many artists on this and I, and I do aim to get more on to talk about it so it's interesting to see how you how you do this take on these fantastic species so thanks for joining me mark oh thanks so much <laughs> cheers take care cheers bye